Good morning again and welcome back to Brighter Morning with Bo. You are watching on MCTV, Multicultural TV in Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean region. And I am Bo Tiwari, host of Brighter Morning with Bo. This morning, our second guest is Ms. Lauren Pouchette. And we will talk with her a little bit as head of the, um, the association that she leads about the tourism industry. Uh, Lorraine, thanks for coming back. I know I, I know we had a chat on Thursday, but I thought it was important because there was so much. The time was short, and there was so much unfinished business. I thought I would have you come back. Now, well, Bo, I want to thank you very much for inviting me back because yes, we did have quite a bit to still discuss. Um, but before we get into the meat of the thing, I want to thank you on two counts. I want to thank you, first of all, on being the catalyst on media to actually give the opportunity for all sides of the divide to be heard and to articulate their perspectives. Um, and, for, and certainly for trying to get um, as many experts in their various fields to talk about the situations that we encounter almost on a daily basis in Trinidad and Tobago. So thank you for that. I really appreciate that. Secondly, I want to thank you in your preamble for laying a foundation for our discussions today. And it seems that we were, we were connected to the same source overnight or this morning because a lot of what you said is going to help me to segue into the points that I would like to make. So I, I really do appreciate this opportunity to be able to continue. Yeah, well, I mean, as you know, I try to prepare for, for my interviews. So um, you did a good job. <laughs> yeah. So I, um, I, I mean, it's the only way to bring professionalism to everything. I want to thank you for your mm -hmm. kind comments. And the whole point about it is that you cannot have a democracy if the media is shut off, shut out from the contending voices in the society. Democracy is a very messy thing, as we know. And sometimes you have all kinds of contending voices and clashes, like one of the big contending voices now is to vaccinate or not to vaccinate. And, but you have to hear all sides, and at the end of the day, you have to make rational decisions that it is in the best national or public interest. And we are happy that you are here to contribute to this discussion. Now, I was reading something by the Secretary General of the UN. And he talked about the tourism industry and what was happening to it and how it needs to get back on its feet, etc. And he made five recommendations. They're very general recommendations, as you would expect a UN Secretary General to make. He's not a tourism expert, but he's talking to all the nations of the world for a global industry in which people go from one place to the other. So he says... The first thing to do is to mitigate socioeconomic impacts of the crisis. Now, what that means is that you've got to look after the businesses and you've got to look at the individuals who are impacted by the loss of economic viability by that industry. Secondly, build resilience across the entire tourism value chain. So if you have a rest period where the tourism industry cannot go, you might as well use that to build resistance into the resistance into the resilience, sorry, into the elements of the value chain. Three, maximize the use of technology in the sector. Well, we know what was happening with digitalization. If you don't have a digital platform today, you're dead. Mm -hmm. And when the world opens up, it's going to be even worse. And um, so that is a critical part. He says, promote sustainability and green growth. And he said this before COP26, uh, anticipating, of course, what was happening there, that the tourism industry needs to be greener. It needs to be more sustainable. And then he said, build partnerships to enhance achievement of the sustainable development goals. As you know, the UN has... 17 sustainable development goals. So he says build partnerships so that as you build the industry, 
you develop these goals. Now, I use that as a way of giving you really a platform, and you are going to do most of the talking. Um, for what is happening in the tourism industry from your perspective, uh, what is happening to players in the industry, what is happening to the, the, the state of the industry, what is being done now and what needs to happen. So I give you that uh, opportunity. Okay. Um, big task, but I'll do my best to answer all the questions. I will start off by um, giving a little brief on what I had already prepared. First and foremost, we need to look at the current situation in Trinidad and Tobago, and we need to be realistic about it. Yes, we are in a, a little precarious position because we are number one in deaths per million per capita in the world, as of what I saw yesterday. Anybody searching on the internet, Googling or destinations to go to, would probably see that within the first few seconds, okay? Um, there is a new variant, as you have said, that is a cause of concern. Um, but more importantly is the perception and the optics that our healthcare system is in some sort of chaos or maybe on the verge of collapse. And you had rightly alluded to the fact that when somebody makes a decision to travel, what they are looking at is if they do get ill in the country that they are going to, that there are resources available to them so that they can mitigate and get through the process of whatever is the illness that they are facing. And with COVID being so rampant, that is a major concern of most people who have been, who are making a decision to travel, whether now or in the future. Now, the challenges for visitors would be, as I said, the number of deaths that they are seeing taking place in Trinidad, the health system. But additionally, you alluded to and you spoke to the crime situation. If we cannot get our internal governance structures in place, and we cannot mitigate crime for our domestic, for our people in Trinidad and Tobago. How can we reassure visitors that they will be safe in Trinidad and Tobago? And I think that's a big thing that we are overlooking because it is directly connected to the whole process of marketing tourism. People will Google your country and they will look to see what is the situation in your country and whether they can take the risk of spending time there. Um, so that the whole governance structure that has to be looked at and how it impacts. Um, basically, you spoke, the first thing you said was to mitigate socio-economical economic impacts. Yes, that's important. And what we have seen is that I, I speak to this ad nauseum. Tourism is private sector driven, but needs to be public sector supported. And therefore, if that is so, um, it would have been an obvious choice, I think, but it's not so obvious because it has not happened that the government or the people in charge of policy and taking care of the various stakeholders would have reached out to the tourism sector to find out what help do you all really need to be able to survive this situation and when we get back on track that we can move forward. There has been no call to support associations so that those associations can support their members. There has been no discussion on that whatsoever. I had spoken previously about the type of uh, assistance, financial assistance given to the members. Two people got a, a grant from NEDCO. A few people got help for their, for their staff uh, salary. That was since last year. Nothing since then. So that these, these situations do not over well and cause migration out of the sector into other sectors or even abroad, because people need to live, people need to survive. So that by the time we come back on for tourism, what is going to happen is that we're going to have a, a, a lack of the type of resources that we would require to deliver a first class product. Now, you spoke about marketing, and that's important. Before COVID-19, there really was no um, there really was no serious marketing strategy taking place for Trinidad particularly and for Trinidad and Tobago generally to attract people to Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I don't know exactly what happens in Tobago, but I certainly know that in Trinidad, stakeholders are not really consulted as to how marketing should take place and what, who are the target markets, where do we get most of our clients from. That conversation has not happened. So it appears that policymakers are making decisions about the tourism industry without actually um, discussing 
and, 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 and collaborating with the providers of the product to understand where we should target, what are the best markets that should come here. For example, I will use an example. Um, tarpoon fishing. We have a member who does tarpoon fishing. And several years ago, um, he had come to us to ask for assistance to be able to host a farm tour, which we did. We requested assistance from the tourism development company at the time, and it was refused. There was no help forthcoming. So on his own and with a little help from his friends, um, he was able to bring in the farm tour. And now the, 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 the request for tarpoon fishing in Trinidad is enormous. It is just it has exploded and once the borders are, are properly open and people are really coming in here i i would see that that would take off in a particular way and that talks to us about speaks to us about how important it is for public private sector partnership and collaboration so if we are trying on our own and be investing a lot of money in in the whole process of tourism then where is the public sector support we are just not seeing it okay um, so what can we do? Well, government needs to bring us to the table. We need to be able to share our expertise, share our ideas, share our concerns, and together, putting all partisanship aside, remember this is Trinidad and Tobago, and we have people that work in our supply chain who belong to all parts of the divide. And we need to ensure that we do what is best for the population for Trinidad and Tobago. So there must be collaboration and consultation. I keep looking at my notes because I want to make sure I don't leave anything out. We also need to, re to remember that tourism is an owner of foreign exchange. People come in, yes, but it is an export product. And we need to understand that we earn quite a bit of foreign exchange in tourism. And, and, and that should not be put aside. And if we can, if we get back on our feet and we increase the product offerings and we attract more visitors, then that is more foreign exchange earnings in the coffers of the government and in the pockets of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. So I think that moving forward, we need to establish a, a, a plan. There's no plan. We have a, a, um, a, a roadmap for recovery. I don't know what's going on in tourism in that. We have not been consulted, really. We have not been brought to the table on that. There is a tourism task force um, recovery subcommittee that or committee that is being, I don't even know exactly what it is, that is being led by the, the new chairman of the board of Tourism Trinidad Limited. And as I had sp spoken to in my last interview with you, I got all over five minutes to be able to make a presentation. Since then, the sound of silence. Nothing is happening. We have not been engaged and we really do not know what is happening. Our tourism stakeholders have done all the training that was required, all the COVID-19, CAFA, et cetera, et cetera, training. Tour guides, sites and attractions, everything, everything to operators, taxi drivers. We have all done the training. So my question is, if we can have um, government sites like Queens Hall, Napa, Sapa, et cetera, that have been made COVID-19 compliant, that have received the tourism safety stamp. Why is it that that outreach has not been done by the government for these sites and attractions in Trinidad and Tobago? Because yes, right now, we are not in a position to welcome everybody with open arms. But we are hoping that with a plan that we come up with together, that has a one-year, two-year, three-year, four-year, five-year process, that we know what we want to achieve in each of those years, and we cater for the fact that we may not get back on our feet in 2022, maybe 2023, but we bring all those variables in we and we come up with a plan. Then we can find ourselves in a position to say, okay, we are aiming for something. We give the stakeholders hope. There is the ability to hold, tighten your belt a little more. Hold on, let us see what is happening. But that is absolutely not happening. You also made a very important point when you said that, um, a report from the United Nations spoke about the fact that the people in the United States were traveling within their own country. They were traveling and, and, and five, um, there were five or, or six states that saw an a, a increase in their domestic tourism. And that is what we have been pushing as the Tour Operators Association, that we need to get our sites and attractions ready. Government, need, government needs to support the site and attraction owners to help them to be able to be compliant, that we need to start promoting a domestic tourism campaign, just like the United States did and was quite successful for, for summer. And we need to um, engage 
in, 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 in having our people be able to participate, not just to earn the income for the various operators and the various um, suppliers to the operators, but also for the mental health of our people. Our people have suffering from cabin fever. Our young people are in distress. Um, socialization and connection is very important. Being able to stimulate our minds is important. Having something to look forward to is important. So our young people, our children are under serious distress. And I can say that with certainty from another hat that I wear as a counselor, where I deal with young people um, and helping them to deal with their anxiety and their depression because of what has been happening over the last two years. So I think that really and truly we, we, we need to get to the table with the government and we need to understand what we have and how we can move it forward. I'm giving you a chance to say something. <laughs> No, no, it is, your, it is your opportunity to talk because you know the industry and you have a very practical uh, approach to it because you know what you are living and you know what is possible. I want to ask you a question, but I'm going to uh, take a commercial break. Uh, and when you come back, you can answer the question. Uh, what, what are Trinidad and Tobago's major source markets especially in Trinidad? And how is the breakdown in leisure as opposed to, let's say, conference and related tourism? And how do you think COVID is likely to affect that now? Because two things that I'm finding reading about it is that leisure travel, because of this cabin fever issue has become uh, more uh, attractive to people, especially since they can work remotely and they don't have to get back to their office. They can go somewhere and spend two weeks, three weeks or whatever. Whereas conference tourism is harder because the structure of industry has changed and you don't have all the people in the offices in the same way anymore. Um, and many of the, the meetings that have been taking place within industries, within companies, across companies have been virtual so that it has made an input, a, 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 it has created a kind of structure of organization there that has affected the whole, uh, what you might call the conference, tourism, psychology. So I want to leave those, I know I've asked you some hard and complex interrelated questions, but reflect on it. And when we come back, if you can address those, I'll be grateful. Don't forget, we start with the source markets. <music> Welcome to the Value Optical Rock the Frame Festival Red Carpet where we... Oh, wait. Rene, is that you? Yes, darling. It is I. Um, okay. <laughs> Who are you wearing today? These are Vogue frames from VO, darling. Yes, boy. I get 15% off of these frames and then I get an next 10% off the adults. Boy! Book online or hurry down to rock your look at the Value Optical Rock the Frame Festival now. Value Optical, expert care for your eyes. Welcome back. Brighter morning with Bo. And I am Bo Tiwari, your host. And we are talking to Lorraine Pouchette, who is head of the uh, tour operators organization in Trinidad and Tobago. Okay, so you Bo? remember what I asked here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, you asked about source markets. You asked about certain percentages. I'll be quite frank with you. I'm not a statistician. 
I don't have stats that I can give you off the top of my head, but what I will say is that over the years, our major store, source markets has been um, the United States and the UK, with some from Canada. Um, we have Germany has always been there, but it, it, it focuses mostly on Tobago. And we have been seeing an we were seeing an increase just before COVID nineteen of visitors actually from China, um, and we do have operators so, that specialize in, in that particular area, China, Japan, and so on. So we do have um, across the board coming from various countries, but the major source markets where we have focused our marketing on has been the USA, the UK, Canada, those types of um, uh, markets. Now the thing is that. From the USA, what we have been finding happening is that it is a lot of the diaspora that returns, and they generally come for carnival. They don't really utilize the um, the facilities of a tour operator because they have family and friends here. But generally, people who come in from the US, we have a lot of universities that our operators collaborate with. They come either for culture to learn about our music, our dance, our culture, the various contributions of the various um, races to Trinidad and Tobago. They come to learn about, they, they like to um, do what they call exchange groups. They like to meet with our people here. We also have sporting groups that come in. Um, before, uh, about eight or 10 years ago, we had a lot of cricketing situations, cricketing matches and, and, and fixtures that used to take place here. And the teams would come and support. Many, many, many teams would come and support. Um, but one of our major um, source markets, which might not be considered a source market, is actually the cruise ships. And we know that the cruise ships have been doing fairly well because um, even with the COVID, because, for example, last week in St. Martin, in one day, they had seven cruise ships called. And their, 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 their COVID protocols are very stringent. And we have not really heard of any negative um, fallout from the cruise ships themselves going to these various countries in, within the Caribbean. Now we must remember that Trinidad is the is, is the last of the chain of the islands in the Caribbean, number one. Secondly, we are the last coming on board with promoting tourism as a, a source of diversification and, and, and an economic earner, okay? So that if you have competition already that existed before COVID-19 for the, for the tourism, product, then it means that you need to do that much more to be able to say that you are going to diversify in a significant way into tourism. And that means that you need to look at your infrastructure. You need to look at your, your product offerings and the, and the quality of the staff that is delivering those product offerings. You need to look at the optics and the perception of who Trinidad and Tobago is and, and, and what are some of the challenges that the visitors would have in coming here. So you spoke also to conference tourism, and I think you are quite right. That is significantly going to change. It is unfortunate that one of the major, um, uh, what should I say, major issues or major proposals coming out of the, um, to the new recovery subcommittee is to have a uh, conference center set up somewhere in the heart of Port of Spain. That's rather unfortunate because that is just mortar brick and mortar, that's a lot of money that is going to be put out for that. And we need to creep before we crawl and crawl before we run and et cetera, because what is happening is that we already have conference facilities. We have conference facilities at major hotels. We have conference facilities at, at medium sized hotels. And we have other conference facilities that can be used because conferences in the future are not going to be mega conferences. They are going to be small, conferences, medium-sized conferences, and it must be um, partnered with the offering to the participants of those conferences that they can enjoy an experience in the country that they are going to. Conferences are now going to be online to the, for, for the majority of what I know and what I am personally experiencing because I attend quite a few webinars and conferences online, um, particularly over the last two years to ensure that I, I continue to increase my knowledge and, and keep my mind alert. But persons are not going to be facilitating these big conferences or destinations. That's going to be very unusual. And those types of conferences will more than likely be government-sponsored um, conferences or government-interested um, conferences. So I hope I have answered your question to some extent. Yeah, the, um, 
You know, the, yes, the, 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 the COP25 conference, which was a large conference mm -hmm. eh, over such a long period. Mm -hmm. And from my understanding of that conference, I mean, not only did you have to honor the protocols um, to get into the country and back home to your country, but you had to be quickly tested every single day. Mm -hmm. uh, in the conference and so on. When I think of those kinds of things, I mean, that is really a hassle. And if you go to a conference for three or four days and you have to be inside and you have to be going through this thing, it really is a hassle. So I think that that kind of uh, program is likely to change, to be altered. And I think in any case, I want to agree with you, you are likely to see smaller tighter conferences, medium-sized conference, in dual mode. So some people mm -hmm. will be uh, virtual attending the conference and you'll have the actual participants who want to travel. So that, and that demands that your technological capability be super, first of all. And secondly, that it, it also demands a rethinking of what you mean by conference facilities. I do agree with you. So I will give you, we we'll come into the, the news time. We've got a break. You see how time flies, but I'm going to give you the last word on this. Okay. So my last word is get us to the table, public private sector partnership. What is the plan? Sound of silence is no longer acceptable. What are the protocols that you want to institute for us to operate within? Open the sites and attractions. Get us moving. Get us earning some income and getting our people on the ground enjoying what Trinidad and Tobago has to offer. Okay. I want to thank you very much, Lorraine Pouchette, for being with us this morning and agreeing to come a second time. It's been a pleasure to talk to you about an industry that is important for the diversification of Trinidad and Tobago. And I want to thank all of you viewers for watching. This is MCTV, Multicultural TV, in Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean region. And this is Brighter Morning with Bo. And I am Bo Tiwari signing off to give Andrew Chan the opportunity to read the news to you.